Uh, you've been analyzing the political moment all morning, right? <laughs> so, I will not say much about that, and I'm going to try to talk about the way forward, which I admit is an intimidating task. Um, we're facing an existential threat. Our country is deeply polarized, and what we as progressives and lefties do in the next two years will determine and shape the political terrain for the next at least two decades. So, we better not fuck it up. <laughs> um, do you feel a little pressure? Every day. Yeah, it's good every day. It's real, right? Um, we need the broadest possible front and a long-term strategy to defeat the rise of the right and neo-fascism. The left, even as it begins to take shape in this period and to grow, is insufficient by itself. In order to have enough people and enough power to prevent this neo-fascism from taking full dominance, we, do, we have to build the broadest possible front of resistance. The tendency that Trump represents isn't going away anytime soon. They've consolidated a new level of structural power through the Trump administration, and it's unclear whether they are in a position of weakness for the next election. Although, man, I hope so. <clears throat> in this context, we need our local base building, our electoral and movement work, to remain strong. And we need urgently to build state and national power and long-term strategy. We can't afford to shrink down our politics to the scale at which we currently have power. We can't just be comfortable in the places where we have enough influence to do things our way. We have to build the kind of power that can contest at the state and national level. That's the kind of power that allows us to do more than bring declarations of solidarity to the people across the world who are depending on us for the future of dem democracy. That's the kind of power that will aim the resistance not at the return of some multicultural neoliberalism, that we didn't like in the first place, but towards the possibility of a socialist future. You can stop if you want. <laughs> let's be real and let's be rigorous about our assessment of this movement that we love, that we're part of, that all of us are responsible for. Although our ranks are growing, and despite what we may be pressured to write in grant reports, we're painfully far from having the power we need to implement the vision that we hold in our hearts. When I consider how much power the right has and how far out of position we are to fight them, I find myself short of breath. Do you? Yeah. yeah. Can we breathe a few times together? Oxygen is helpful. <laughs> and we still have some of it. <laughs> the other thing I find helpful is learning from the movements that came before me. Uh, Martha Harnaker, survivor of the Chilean dictatorship, said this, For the left, politics must be the art of making the impossible possible. We're not talking about a voluntarist declaration. We're talking about understanding politics as the art of constructing a social and political force capable of changing the balance of force in favor of the popular movement in such a way as to make possible in the future what appears today to be impossible. I'm with that. <laughs> what would it look like to make the impossible possible? I think that means four things for us. Reimagine power 
so we can show up differently. Build a broad front to fight like hell for democracy. Independent political organization and a long-term structural reform agenda. Reimagine power so we can show up differently. If we're going to construct a force capable of changing the correlation of forces, we have to reimagine power. Most of us have experienced power negatively in our lives. The power that institutions and the individuals held over us the pain, the violence, the oppression that represents. So sometimes our instinct is to avoid power altogether, to consider power itself to be the problem. Dr. King addressed this brilliantly when he said, power is the ability to achieve a purpose. Whether it is good or bad depends on the purpose. The most exciting thing about this movement moment is that we're building a more clear perspective about the question of power. Most people would say, we need more power than we have. It's more important than ever that we cut the bullshit and be rigorous in our assessments of the power we have, the power we don't have, and what it would take to build the power we need. Power exists in many places. Personal transformation, interpersonal change, organizational transformation, all of these forms of power are really important in our movement. But no amount of personal transformation or group agreements will change the conditions that marginalize us in the first place. No local candidate or policy change campaign can counter the balance of power that the right is consolidating nationally and internationally. Although these forms of power are important, by themselves, they're insufficient. In order to win national elections, it takes 30 to 40 million people. We can only reach that scale of power if we think about it differently. And if we use these skills that we've gained from these smaller battles to build the larger power that we need. The kind of power we need is multidimensional. Three aspects of that power that we need are community organizing campaigns, movement infrastructure, and the ability to make meaning on the terrain of ideology and worldview. We need people-powered organizations. Raise your hand if you're part of one. Good for you. <laughs> Lots of people are getting mobilized. If you're, everybody has an aunt or a sister or a neighbor that went to their first protest since Trump got elected, right? We need infrastructure to channel individuals into sustained, long-term political engagement towards collective power. It's crucial for mass organizations to fight and win community and labor organizing campaigns. But those one-time transactions that transfer power over a couple of years by themselves are insufficient. We need infrastructure to set the agenda. We need to aggregate our power through mergers, alliances, and building new power through new vehicles and opportunities that present themselves. Only a major movement realignment and consolidation will give us the opportunity to contend for power. That's the kind of infrastructure that's capable of, what, of changing what's on the political agenda. We also need to help everyday people make meaning on the terrain of ideology and worldview. The right does this so well, and it's in our faces all the time. <laughs> the most transformative organizing campaigns aren't just a transaction where city government agrees to do something. They're also ways that help make, make meaning with people. They build and exercise the power of a base of people strong enough to defend the gains that have been won. Organized people are long-term infrastructure. And most people are still not in a mass organization. The crisis that we've seen, the fires, the floods, the mass shootings, they're going to continue. Another economic downturn is on the horizon. Can we pre prepare now to rapidly respond to the opportunities, not just for mobilization and mutual aid, but to help society as a whole make sense of what's happening? Find each other in times of crisis. Imagine a positive future, a left way out of the mess. 
I'm not talking about a declaration about what is wrong with the world that will pull people's, the wool from people's eyes. Trust me, because I wrote that flag. <laughs> it was an eight-point font. <laughs> it did not succeed in bring neo bringing neoliberalism to its knees, despite my best intentions. I'm talking about organizing on the terrain of worldview and ideology to build a new common sense about politics. Making meaning is a social process, not a transfer of correct ideas from one person to the other. As we face this existential crisis of the political moment, our movement's also in an existential crisis, and maybe many of us are too. Questioning who we are, who is on our side, whether there's a way forward. <coughs> what would it look like in this context to build a movement that isn't focused on itself, but instead on changing the correlation of forces in society as a whole? on those 30 to 40 million people. For our movement to change society, we need to show up differently. Are we ready to let go of the quest to find the purest expression of our politics? If too many of us are using political work primarily as a vehicle to validate the uniqueness of our identity, the culture of neoliberalism is driving our movement. And what we get from that is individual short-term solutions to systemic problems that we can have the power to fix if we're able to think and work collectively. The stakes are too high. We can't afford to shrink down our objectives to the scale at which we have influence to do things our way and to feel comfortable. My identity is not the fucking point of my political work. I am not in this movement because of who I am. I'm in this movement because of who I want to be, which I can only become if we work together. I know from my own experience of 20 years of grassroots organizing, that transformation happens through the process of collective struggle, through the victories and lessons that we've learned. That's where the transformative change happens. What would it look like to focus on those 30 to 40 million people we need to win over, and to leverage all of our identities, all of our kinds of power, to win them over? We have a bigger vision than any individual person, single community, or, scale, or the scales at which we have power right now. We have to take the long view and do the hard work that it takes to build the power that will change the correlation of forces. <coughs> what would it look like to seek out strategic points of intervention? To build the kinds of unity to make those interventions? To play individual roles in a collective struggle? like a football team. Everybody's on the same team. That doesn't mean everybody plays the same position. People play different positions on a team, but it's a team. <laughs> and any good team needs to know their opposition. And the strategy begins when your team understands your strengths and is able to leverage them against the opposition's weakness. A broad, fight to, uh, a broad front to fight like hell for democracy. Uh, there's a real and powerful movement towards authoritarian dictatorship in our country. It's organizing on the terrain that's already there of white supremacy and patriarchy, ideologies that move towards destroying what is left of our democracy. We could critique that from the sidelines and prove the things we knew all along. Patriarchy is an ideology of violence. Bourgeois democracy is a sham. White supremacy is a cross-class ideology. And white working class people with reactionary ideas are just a sideshow compared to the white bourgeoisie who are running this country and burning the planet at the speed of capital. 
these things may be true, and it feels good to say them. <laughs> but it is not a magical spell that makes them go away. <laughs> it's time we do something braver. We could jump into the fray and do the hard and meaningful work of changing the correlation of power. We need to fight like hell for our democratic rights. This is a fundamental and structural barrier, particularly at the state level and the national level, to the new American majority of people of color and the new formulations of family and gender to exercise our emerging power. It relates to every issue, every community, every front of struggle we care about. We have to fight for the democratic rights of everyday people and engage the democratic process, as flawed as it is. What's left of our democratic rights is the power standing between us and fascism. In Florida, I was able to witness and be a small part of an enormous statewide effort that restored voting rights to 1.2 formerly incarcerated people, 1.2 million. This work that folks did that reenfranchised 1.2 million formerly incarcerated people, mostly black men, changes the terrain fundamentally for Florida and for our country. And it was part of a long-term strategy. This wasn't a, just a campaign to right a wrong. It was part of a long-term strategy to expand democracy. The millions of people whose voting rights rights were restored are mostly people of color and will change the electorate of Florida and have decisive influence in the future of our country. This was decided 10 years ago and it came to fruition this year. What would it look like to think in 10 year increments about democracy? Independent political organizations we in the U.S. have neglected two key and interconnected terrains of struggle that I think are crucial over the next 10, 20 years. We need to better understand the terrain of the Democratic Party and of the state in order to make strategic interventions. And we need to build the front broad enough to make those interventions. I know you hate the Democratic Party. Raise your hand if you hate the Democratic Party. <laughs> okay. Raise your hand if they're your friend of me. <laughs> Complicated. Very 21st century kind of relationship. <laughs> Raise your hand if you're seeing other parties. <laughs> you're open to it. Like if, if a different party showed up, you'd be like, I would like to see other parties. <laughs> That's called fusion voting. And it's... Um, the fight against the fight to like help for democracy would involve it. So um, we need to treat the Democratic Party not as a monolithic target, but as a terrain of struggle upon we could make upon which we could make advances if we built independent political organizations. Now I'm not saying we should all go into the Democratic Party and be subservient to its corporate neoliberal leadership. No, there would be bark everywhere. <laughs> I've already seen that movie, I know how it ends. Some people were here, were there, tried it. Raise your hand if you tried it. Thank you, bless your heart. Um, raise your hand if you're trying it now. Thank you, bless your heart. Nobody's raising their hand. I hope that you're just shy of sharing that, because otherwise we're fucked. Um, What I'm saying is that we need to build an independent political organization that can link the struggle outside and sometimes against the Democratic Party to the insurgency that's already happening, with or without us, within the Democratic Party. The same can be said of the state. I just got elected to the Rampart in Berkeley. <laughs> Look me up on the internet. They did it anyway. 
Trump is president. It does open room for the left. Um, I've seen it in my own eyes from the inside in a way that I could never have seen from the outside, which was part of my motivation for going into that new position. There's a ton of room for progressive ideas inside the terrain of the state. And a complex structure dedicated to keeping things the way they are. Only an independent political organization can help create the kind of elected officials the left we hope to build will need in order to drive its agenda. We need to build infrastructure for an electoral expression of our social movement. A long-term structural reform agenda. Most of us can describe the world we wish to see. Have you been in that workshop? <laughs> <laughs> There's a butcher paper, a sun, there's usually a sun. <laughs> Everyone has what they need to live. It sounds pretty much like socialism or anarcho-communism or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of alignment on that. There's always a sun, for example. <laughs> no, really, there's alignment. It's, it's good, it's good. Um, but when we check in with ourselves and we look at that picture and we ask ourselves, how long would it take to get there given where we are? <laughs> we would say maybe 50 years. That's what I've heard a lot. We have to square that reality off <laughs> with the scale at which we're doing our work. We're doing our, the most visionary campaigns that I have been a part of were five years long. Can we articulate? a series of non-reformist reforms, structural changes that build, the, build on the power that we've built through these short-term organizing campaigns and towards this vision, this amazing butcher paper, this socialist utopia that our children can imagine in the childcare right now. Everybody's sharing, it sounds great. How do we build that capacity to think at that 10, 20 year level? Can we articulate a series of structural changes that we can then build campaigns in relationship to? A number of us here have been working on the repeal of Prop 13 in California that will go on to the ballot in 2020. <laughs> That was a 10-year campaign led by organizations of people of color reaching infrequent and unlikely voters through community organizing work and through voter mobilization. So it wasn't the usual like, hello, we want your vote, fuck you until the next election. You know? <laughs> it was real engagement with real people. And it took 10 years to get it on the ballot. And what's on the ballot is a small piece of it, actually. But it builds on the last piece of it that was on the ballot a few years ago and the piece before that. That was a structural reform. What would it look like to build an agenda of these kinds of structural changes at the state level in California here and all over the country? And could we imagine bringing those together as the foundation of an independent political organization nationally able to fight on the terrain of elections? Those of us who identify with these left ideas are neither strong enough in numbers or consolidated enough on a strategic orientation in order to win. Could we build consensus around a series of structural changes, non-reformist reform, that mark and test the power we're building towards transformational change? That would put us on the path towards a multidimensional view of power, towards governing power. It would guide progressives who get into office so they're able to do more than administer austerity in the least horrible way. Last year, I was able to sit with Rosita Tobia, 
a leader from the FMLN women's sector in El Salvador. I talked to her about this. She said the FMLN had identified the struggle for public education and public health as key fronts in the struggle against privatization. She said they knew they didn't have the power to stop the privatization of their banking system. Her country runs on American dollars and is beholden to outside financial corporations with a couple of individuals making money hand over fist over that transfer of public goods into the private sector. They focused instead on waging the struggle to defend education and health care, inside and outside of the government. They did nationwide strikes, they had government-run women's health centers, and public sector teacher and student organizing. They knew that they were in government, but didn't have governing power. So they built a strategy based on that assessment. Could we imagine making assessments that rigorous? Decisions that difficult? Orienting our work towards a collective structural change agenda. Our work isn't easy. None of these things that I've proposed are, are easy. There's no guarantee that humanity is going to get it together. This isn't a Disney movie, it's real life. Victory is won through struggle. Our victory is far from guaranteed. But if we don't fight, we have already lost. When we stumble, may we learn something new about the terrain and build our strength so we can keep marching forward. May each iteration of our collective struggle make new things possible for each of us and for all of us. The path to power is one we will have to build and walk together. Uh, Antonio Gramsci, who did his groundbreaking work in a prison cell, said, the challenge of modernity is to live without illusion, but without becoming disillusioned. I think that's what our movement needs in order to face the next two years of struggle, which will only intensify. As we face our existential fears, let's also not lose sight of the fact that we're witnessing the rebirth of the social movements of our country. We are not alone. We are millions. Let's act that way. <laughs>